So welcome again to part two of Learning to be Centered During Challenging Times. I'm Denise Jacuto. And I'm Kate Jones. We're glad to see you today. Thanks for being here. Yes, thank you so much. So I'm going to do my presentation about moxibustion and essential oils, and then Kate will present on... I'm going to go deeper today on the physiology and the neurophysiology of what happens when we take that diaphragmatic breath. Great, wonderful. So uh, this is the second part of a three-part workshop on learning to be centered in challenging times. Uh, we are presenting today and then next Thursday, May 28th at 12 p.m. Pacific time. And if you have any questions between our episodes, please reach out to Kate or myself. And there's our email addresses and phone numbers on the screen. So I'm Denise Jacuto, licensed acupuncturist and Chinese herbalist. I have been practicing in Alameda and San Francisco for about 15 years um, as an acupuncturist and herbalist, and now I do telemedicine as well. I've just started back in my offices about a week and a half ago. And I know it's going to be slow, uh, slow going as we slowly open back up during the pandemic. And we want to make sure we give people some self-care tips they can do at home. So today I'm going to talk about moxibustion and essential oils. I'm going to focus on the safety of essential oils rather than the scents themselves, because you can use your nose doctor just as well as I can to decide what essential oils you like and which are good for your your nose and your body, but the safety of how to use them is the key. So here we go with part two of quick self-care tips from Chinese medicine to help you during difficult times. So what the heck is moxibustion? It's a Chinese herb. It's also called Artemisia vulgaris, and that's named after the goddess Artemis. And we use it in Chinese medicine to burn it on or near an acupuncture point. And it's really important to know that in the actual word that we translate as acupuncture from the Chinese into English, the word genju actually translates to acupuncture and moxibustion. So that gives you an idea of how it is really integral to our medicine. And you might know moxa from the smell. If you go into your acupuncturist's office, you might smell something smoky. And some people mistake it for marijuana, but it's not marijuana. It's a different plant altogether. I usually, in my offices, will use the smoke less version. And I emphasize the less because it's not entirely smoke free. There is a little bit of smoke. Um, because in the offices I'm in, nobody really wants to have a smoky smell in the office. And also, I also send people home with the smokeless versions. And usually, they'll find that their partners and their pets are more amenable to using the smokeless version at home. So we use moxibustion in Chinese medicine to warm the body, to bring more qi and blood flow to the area. We use it where there's stuck energy or pain in the body or where you feel cold in your body. We use moxa to strengthen the immune system on a point that we'll show in just a minute in a dem demonstration video I've done. I also wanted to say that um, it's a very interesting point that in, it re was recorded in ancient literature that moxa smoke was used to prevent epidemics and it's now used to sterilize the air in hospital wards in China. And you can say that doing acupuncture is a way to stimulate the acupuncture points. Also at home, it's really great to use moxa. You are actually activating those acupuncture points with the moxa at home. And that's a really great thing to do right now as we're sheltering in place. So in the demonstration video, you'll see in a minute, I'll show you how to do moxibustion on this one point, stomach 36, and I encourage you to do it at home. You can spend 10 to 15 minutes twice a day, um, maybe five minutes on each leg, because it is bilateral, it's on both of your legs. Um, 
And while you're watching TV, a webinar, whatever you're watching right now, because we're watching a lot of screen time, <laughs> uh, you can spend that time and actually help improve your health. Next slide, I think, is the actual demonstration video. When I light mocks, I usually use the candle, and that makes it easier to light when we're doing mock combustion. These are stick-on moxas, and I've lit this first one here, showing where stomach 36 is, and I'll give you a more detailed account of that in a minute. But this is just something you light with a candle and you stick it onto the acupuncture point and you let it burn until it feels hot to you. Uh, when you're doing this on yourself, it's really easy to know really quickly when it's hot for you and then you take it off when it gets hot and then you'll put it in to a bowl with sand or rice to extinguish it. And when it gets hot, grab it at the ends and take it off. And there is my bowl of ashes with sand and rice in it that I've been using for a while and use moxa. I'm gonna show you how to use another kind of stick on moxa. That was a Japanese kind. And then this is the Korean kind of moxa. Same principle, it just looks differently. There's a sticker on the bottom, you take away the protective wrapper and then you light it. You blow on the moxa to make sure it gets orange or red, like the orange you're seeing in the flowers on the video. And then to find stomach 36, you run your finger up the bone in front of your leg, the tibia, up the front until your finger just sort of pushes off to the side. Your body will just slide your finger right off the bone to the side and that depression is stomach 36. Use a firm pressure to stick the moxa on. You're gonna let that burn down. This one burns a little bit longer than the Japanese moxas. As you can tell, this one's longer than the Japanese moxas were. Um, and you let this burn for a while. When it starts to feel hot, you grasp it at the end. This, in this case, you grasp it at the green part of the moxa, which is just a cardboard around the actual burning moxa. You take it off and put it into the ashtray. So there are different kinds of moxa, all different kinds of moxa. This is an easy one to do at home. There's also moxa sticks. I have several moxa buster demonstration videos for using moxa sticks, using what's called a tiger warmer, which kind of looks like a pen with a stick of moxa inside and a cap, a metal cap that you put on that's, that has vents in it. And you use that directly on the acupuncture points. And all these videos are available on my YouTube channel and we'll have those links in the show notes. And if you have any questions, of course, please ask me as well. So now we're gonna talk about essential oils and how to use them with acupressure. As I said earlier, I wanna focus this part of the talk on safety because it's really important to be safe when you're using essential oils. Essential oils are great for accessing emotions and spirit levels of our, of our bodies. Um, they're really quick to act on your emotions. You smell an essential oil and it instantly can flood your, your brain with memories and associations. And so that's the really great thing about essential oils. They work quickly. They also kind of dissipate quickly. They, they're very ethereal in that way. They do um, wear off kind of quickly. Um, you can use essential oils on your pulse points, on your, on your wrist. You can wear them on a scarf. You can put them on acupressure areas, such as the stomach 36 I showed you earlier. Um, 
some people are starting to ask about, can we use them in the cloth face masks that we're using now when we go outside? And I would just caution to use it diluted in um, a carrier oil. Now, I'm going to say that about all essential oils in general is to make sure you dilute them in a carrier oil, um, especially when you have it close to your face. A very full strength essential oil is going to irritate your, your, your nasal passages and your skin. So you want to have it diluted. Um, and in the show notes, I'll have a link to um, Mountain Rose Herbs has, has a dilution chart, but just to give you an example, in one ounce of carrier oil, you would put six drops of an essential oil or six drops of total of a few essential oils into that one ounce of carrier oil to make a 1% dilution or 12 drops of essential oils to make a 2% dilution. And those are safe guidelines. Now, what's a carrier oil? A carrier oil can be any oil you would like to use as a base for your essential oils, olive oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil. Um, I caution against sesame oil because it has a very, very pungent quality. If you like that scent, great. But if some people say that they do smell like Chinese food <laughs> when they use sesame oil as a base, um, it can make you hungry. <laughs> um, so in, in uh, blending essential oils like I have with um, my alchemist partner, um, Kirsten Cowan from Angelic and Peony, we have used different oils to go along with different elements in Chinese medicine. We use olive oil because it's green for the wood element, which is associated with green, for example. We used almond oil because it's a clear white, whitish oil for using with the metal element blends because the metal element is associated with the color white, for example. And um, another point about safety, I'll say um, essential oil diffusers, people always ask about that. Like I'm starting to people are starting to ask me, well, shouldn't you have an essential oil diffuser in your office? Well, we have one in my San Francisco office. It's at the front desk. The front desk person really loves her essential oil diffuser. Um, my caution is I don't want it to be on when there are children or immunocompromised people in the office because it can be very hard on our systems. There is a story about um, some firefighters going to a daycare a couple of years ago because children in the daycare were having carbon monoxide poisoning symptoms. And they traced it back to the essential oil diffuser that was being used, you know, and the people in the daycare thought it was a good idea. And, you know, you can use essential oil diffusers at home but it's probably not a good idea to use them in shared places, especially if you're going to be having, if you have children or immune compromised people in the rooms. So my essential oil blends, I mentioned, I have a partner in alchemy, uh, Kirsten Cowan. We designed our essential oil blends to have two blends per Chinese element. So there are five Chinese elements and we'll talk about them a little more in my section next week. Um, with the five elements, we've chosen one more calming blend and one more boosting blend. So there's a calming blend is the more yin blend to calm the system. And the yang blend is a more boosting blend to strengthen or move qi in the body. And we've made these blends in sacred space during their season of power. So what I mean by that is the wood element blends were blended in the springtime. The fire element blends are blended in the summertime. The earth element, element blends are blended in late summer. The metal element in the fall and the water element in the winter. And I'll have some more links in the show notes. The thing that makes us, our blends kind of unique is that we do use Chinese herb essential oils in our blends. And we get those Chinese herb essential oils from Alchemical Botanica and they do exclusively Chinese herb essential oils. And they also, at this time right now, they have some special blends that they're making to help 
respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and to help your immune system as well. So I want to give them a shout out and we'll have their link in the show notes too. So in addition to this workshop right now during shelter in place, as long as we're sheltering in place, I'm doing a meditation series about the five elements every Friday at noon on Instagram. It's my living with the five elements meditation series. And please join me. It's about 15, 20 minutes long. You know, it's a really short, sweet time to take a break in the middle of your work day if you're working from home and I hope to see you there. Thank you so much. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kate. Aha, uh -huh. wonderful. Hey, thank you so much, Denise. Um, that was wonderful to be refreshed, particularly, well, to be educated about moxibustion. I always wondered how that worked. <laughs> so. There's that, and um, my gratitude about uh, queuing up the idea of the essential oils again, particularly since we are wearing masks um, and managing more uncertainty than usual. I think that will be a very uh, helpful addition. So thank you. So hello, everyone. Um, my segment today, as a body-centered life coach, is I wanted to take, take it a little deeper into our understanding when, whether we're in a spiritual practice or whether we're managing anxiety, it, if you notice any of these um, uh, 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 workshops or education frames, tell us always to do what first, is to uh, slow down and begin to focus on our breathing. Um, we understand that, but I thought it would be wonderful and helpful to know why that's the go-to modulation uh, step uh, to begin to help us uh, really moderate levels of anxiety or fear and bring us back into a more regulated, um, moderated mind-body uh, state. I do, let me just say that um, I've been working on and in my business, of, it's called Body Mind Movement as a business, as a body-centered life coach. Um, gosh, I've been in this exploration longer than many of you have been born, so I've <laughs> been alive, uh, for about 32 years, I think. Um, so I'm deeply, deeply interested in how the unification of our mind, body, movement, and spirit uh, integrate and are designed to work together. So I'm hoping these few comments today will help that. Uh, the topics, as you can see here on our slide, I want to talk again, as I did last week, further about the vagus nerve. Um, I'll talk about that. We're going to talk about the function of the diaphragm, and that is our breathing muscle. And then uh, speak about what happens as we deepen our breathing uh, within the vagus, <clears throat> the vagal nerve system and how that uh, helps moderate um, heart rate and uh, our mood states. And then we'll close with a little practice of what's called a four to eight ratio breath. So the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is, is the 10th cranial nerve. It's, uh, there are 12 ner uh, cranial nerves that issue from the brain exit the brain in some way and travel into the uh, body. The vagus nerve is the longest of uh, those nerves. And vagus from the Greek means wanderer or wondering. Our vagus nerve uh, innervates every organ uh, in the body so that it establishes a networking inter- intercommunication system between the organs and uh, the messages, uh, the sensory nerves that can send data up to the brain and then 
uh, the brain processes that data and sends information back into the system. So the vagus nerve is called the mind-body nerve for that reason. Uh, also, I'll just gently say, in your work, in your life, uh, you may find yourself saying or hearing it said, oh God, I felt that in my gut, or my gut told me I should have turned left and I didn't, uh, or that beautiful music just opened my heart. You hear people, we, we speak this way, but what's wonderful to know is because of the nature of the vagus, um, uh, we're we're actually uh, taking in information from the uh, environment directly. This is called neuroception. And our organ systems can process incoming data before it becomes uh, cognitively understood. <laughs> so it's actually really fascinating to think and understand that we have interoception, that we're our organ systems are processing um, data about the environment all the time. Um, when it comes to talking about the vagus nerve, I always like to pause and acknowledge this man, Dr. Stephen Porges. Uh, he has dedicated his professional life, over 40 years of research on the, the function of the vagus, um, and how it, it um, informs us not only about threat, because it processes our relative safety in the environment, but it also is responsible for our ability to be uh, socially engaged and meaningfully engaged with others for nourishment and um, support. Um, so that's Dr. Stephen Porges. Very, if you, if, you, if you YouTube Dr. Porges, if you're curious about the vagus, he's the go-to doc, and I encourage you to noodle around. You'll find a wealth of information. So let's talk a moment about what it means to breathe diaphragmatically or uh, you engaging the diaphragm to breathe. Uh, what I found here is this is a simple uh, little image that hopefully will help uh, make it clear about where the diaphragm is and how it functions on the inhalation and exhalation. Let me first say this. The, the diaphragm is our breathing muscle, okay? However, when we are anxious and experiencing um, different levels of anxiety, you notice yourself. You never ever notice how your breath gets really shallow and it's like <gasps> right? in states of stress. Uh, we can breathe and manage on a very shallow breath that doesn't involve moving the diaphragm. So it's important to know you can make the decision to turn on the diaphragm in your breathing practice. Okay, so let's look at what happens here on an inhalation of breath. On the inhalation of breath, that thin dome-shaped uh, muscle of the diaphragm, which if you palpate around the base of your ribs, the diaphragm attaches pretty much all the way around the perimeter of the rib cage. And it sits in the thorax like a dome when it's relaxed. When we take the breath in, the dome drops down, as you can see in the diagram. It depresses downward and it pushes actually on the visceral organs below it, which is fascinating because by doing that, we're giving the viscera your intestines and more things, uh, a little massage, right? They get a little benefit. On the exhalation of breath, the diaphragm reverts back to that concave shape and it's helping push old air out of the lungs and uh, takes pressure off of the viscera. 
here's, here's some lovely other piece to, that fascinates me about diaphragmatic breathing. I'd like you to think about your heart for just a second. The heart, as you know, has a sac around it that holds the heart. That sac is called the pericardium, okay? Off the pericardium extend two tendons. Those tendons uh, engage with the diaphragm, okay? So the heart, which begins to beat first thing in utero ages ago, and it works womb to tomb without interruption. Beep, beep, boom, boom. That beating muscle, when that diaphragm descends, it tugs on those tendons, which pull the pericardia closer around the heart, and that gives the heart a little massage and gives it a little rest, right? A little sweetness. And that's, isn't that to rest those muscles a little? Okay, and then when you exhale, it, it releases the pericardia again. So there you have, there's the movement of the diaphragm. So that was looking at the gross anatomy. This image here helps us see the perambulations of the vagus nerve. And you can appreciate a little bit in this image how it truly is a wandering nerve. Now, this nerve uh, all innervates, um, moves through the diaphragm. It connects the heart, the lungs, all organs. When the, we, we begin to engage a diaphragmatic breath and we begin to extend the exhalation consciously, i.e. a more relaxed breathing pattern, as we begin to slow the exhalation phase, guess what happens on the vagus nerve? When the vagus nerve registers a slower exhalation, it secretes a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. So what's the big deal about acetylcholine? You know what it does? Acetylcholine, when it reaches the heart, it slows the interval of beats, um, the heartbeat. It slows that interval. So in anxious states, the heart is beating more rapidly. As we slow the breath, the vagus recognizes a slower exhalation phase, secretes acetylcholine, which is a slight numbing agent, and that slows the heartbeat, which then regulates the heart into a, uh, uh, a rhythm that signals the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest version of the nervous system to be dominant. Isn't that re remarkable? <laughs> I just think it's tremendous. So that's the magic of shifting state when we're anxious to mo moderated. We're moving from fight flight into rest and digest, but these are the anatomical mechanisms that allow that to happen. Pretty cool. Okay, so now let's go. Uh, oh, what I wanted to say then in closing is here's the practice that will help you um, think about and engage with the um, moderating of uh, the heart rate and uh, bringing about a more centered state in which we can actually think more clearly and act more clearly. So here's what we do. Think now with me. Um, if you let your hands rest on your belly for just a moment, you take your breath in through the nose and on the inhalation, expand the belly as best you can. Here we go. Let's breathe in, expand the belly and think of four beats. As you exhale, purse your lips a little bit and imagine you're blowing out 
candles on a cake, okay? And we're gonna do that for eight beats. So the inhalation, expand the belly, four beats. Exhale, purse the lips, slow it down, eight beats. Let's try this together. We'll go through two full cycles of this together. But before we do that, take a moment and take a reading on, get two indexes of something you feel, emotionally, physically. Take a moment. Okay, you have a reading of one or two elements. So now, keep that in mind. We'll, we'll return to that in a moment. And now let's put our attention hand on belly. We're gonna breathe in through the nostrils. Breathe in, two, three, four. Exhale. <sighs> Breathe in through the nostrils. Exhale with a hiss. One more time. In through the nose. Exhale out. Now pause. Let your breathing go on automatic. Maybe you close your eyes for a moment. And now take another reading internally. Notice how you feel and harvest the benefit of a diaphragmatic breath. So thank you. That's my practice. It's been fun. By the way, if you do that breath cycle 10 times, that will guarantee to reset your system. It's been a pleasure. If you have any questions, please email or call. Certainly that's true of Denise's questions as well, questions for her. We're thrilled that you're here. And now we want to thank our, is that right, Denise? Don't we want to thank our wonderful our wonderful wizard behind the scenes, Allison. who is Miss Allison. Yeah. <laughs> Allison Victor, buddy. Yeah. If you need help streaming your business meetings like a pro, she can help you. She's helped us. Uh, if you need help with Zoom, Skype, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn with live or pre-recorded video. She, she is a wizard. Allison. She is a wizard. Go Allison ahead. Allison the streaming wizard. <laughs> Thank you so much. And now we'll have a dance party to take us out. We look forward to seeing you again next Thursday. Join us again for the second part, the third part of our workshop. Mm -hmm. I'll be discussing a little bit about Chinese herbs and safety and also about uh, six healing sounds, meditation and Qigong exercises. Kate, what will you be focused on? I'm going to focus uh, next week on uh, a little deeper information about uh, bringing about a holistic, uh, integrated sense of the whole body by educating about the core and the periphery of the body and some exercise, few, a few very simple exercises to bring the whole system online. Wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Thank we you. See you again next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>